uh, if you've listened to Professor Falola, you will appreciate, he's a very, very entertaining lecturer and I suspect you will enjoy uh, listening to him a bit more than me sort of wandering through an introduction, right? What I would like to say about the handbook is that it has 42 chapters, uh, 36 different authors, again, 700 pages. And uh, I would say it's a labor of persistence and ultimately of joy. Okay? The goal from the beginning with that volume was to say to uh, people interested in the study of African Christianity, there has certainly been some great writing in the past, but most of it's now dated. So we would like maybe to sort of create uh, a, a volume that could be a gateway to new research and further research in the future. And in some very basic ways, I think we did that. Now, I wanna stop for a second and, 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 and say, well, how did I come to be part of this? Okay. Uh, I, it, by my count in the past, I have had, uh, well, Professor Palola is easily the most productive scholar in African studies and in African history. And uh, so I have had plenty of occasions in the past to sort of uh, be published in, in edited volumes by him. He was also the editor of the uh, book series well, from my, my second monograph, uh, uh, as case for Jason Bruner as well. Uh, and uh, what, uh, excuse me, what those of us who sort of know the literature appreciate, those of us who study African history, there was a very, very gifted scholar back in the 19th century that uh, really from 1880 to about 1910 sort of dictated the directions in which uh, thoughts about Africa really went in the Western world. That was Edward W. Blyden. And if you look at the uh, uh, table of contents of our volume, that is the first chapter. But what I'd like to say here, and forgive me, to, uh, for Prof, but to my mind, Professor Palola is the direct heir. And the closest thing to a scholar who has successfully communicated across the African diaspora, across the Atlantic, and presumably now Pacific and Indian Oceans, the importance of Africa, the importance of an African perspective. It's that, uh, that's not a new sort of awareness on my part. That's something that came to a long time ago which is why, even though I did not think I was the person for the job, I agreed to be the editor of the Palgrave Handbook. That was back, back in uh, 2018. And you, know, you see where we're at now. So it's been six years and a, a lot of ups and downs, et cetera, but six years and we're here now. And uh, I am very, very pleased with the volume. Uh, I just wanna say some thank yous. I, I don't know how many of the actual contributors uh, are actually sort of tuning in on the Zoom session. But if you were a contributor, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart because the best thing about this for me, and this is the reason for the joy, the best thing was really to appreciate the, the quality of the work people sent in and the fact that they were motivated to, to give it their best and to produce some really informative writing that I'm hopefully going to, is hopefully going to shape the next generation, right? There are a couple of uh, students I'd like to thank. Uh, uh, what is it? Uh, Fenton O'Halloran and then Meredith Nichols, who were both uh, people that I got from the Center for Study of Religion and Conflict and who helped me out. So ultimately, yes, this was a wonderful experience and a very positive one. And uh, I would say that he was inspired by Professor Paloma. Uh, Paloma. He was the editor, but he's also the inspiration. And uh, on that happy note, I'm really going to invite him to come and speak on the topic of Christianity in modern Africa. Uh, okay, thank you. Well, it's a pleasure for me to be here. And um, I want to express my profound gratitude to the university. I've been here a few times. This is not my first time. I've been here when it used to be history department or the chair of department and things like that. And I was here when the new president was doing reorganization. And I was part of, I was listening to all the 
conversations. And I was invited to be one of the evaluators of the African Studies Program, which we did for two or three days with a very long report, uh, thinking that maybe it will grow bigger and then the new transformation school came. Um, and our friends here, I want to thank um, my good friend, Chuki. We've, I've known him for many, many years in relation to slavery studies and um, things like that. And he was gracious to host me to dinner yesterday evening in his lovely house, making good lamb and um, couscous, organic couscous, he called it. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I've published some of our colleagues here in some of my series. And I co-edited a book, a major, major book with Cambridge University Press, co-authored with Professor Usman Aribidesi. And the book has done well on the Yoruba people. So I'm at home here. And the last time I came here, I think, it was to be part of the Center for Religious Studies. They invited me. And I remember that very moment. Um, and the keynote speaker spoke to a book, The Age of Anger. And, and it's, I've, I've been using that thesis, drawn from that keynote for a variety of things, out from Pakistan to Nigeria. Modernity has failed. And because modernity has failed, uh, people take to various dimensions in terms of their responses. And Christianity will be that. I saw one or two people on Zoom. This is 1 a.m. I don't know why they woke up to listen to me. I thank them. One of them has been very consistent. Um, I gave four lectures in Ghana. I saw him listening there. And then I came here from Liberia. So I've been on the lecture circuit for some time. And I made into Nigeria on Friday to give a, 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 you call it commencement in the US, to give a commencement speech. I write all my lectures, all of them. I write them, but I don't read my lectures. I speak to my lectures. And in speaking to this lecture, I will expand the contents of the handbook rather than taking from them. And I will start by saying that Christianity has depth, which the handbook really captured. That's why they call it from apostolic times. And that depth is captured in a history that sometimes is part of the post-Hellenistic world, part of the early Christian church. Some who have made the point that Africa produced some popes in, in North Africa. And many may not be aware that Judaism was established in parts of Africa, not just North Africa, there have been Jews in part of North Africa historically, but that, that Judaism spread in the horn of Africa up until Ethiopia. You remember how the DNA confirmed that there were Africans who are Jewish people. How many of you are aware of that? And the state of Israel went to take them, to relocate them back to Israel. And far more fundamentally, in that Judaism moment, you find the connection between the areas you call Horn of Africa and Ethiopia. Dating back to one of the most creative histories, you can call it real history, you can call it mythologies, how the Ethiopian queen traveled to meet Solomon, the king. It's, it's very well recorded in the Bible. 
And the great king made love to her, made love to the maid. They didn't know they were pregnant until they got back to Ethiopia. Go and read it. That's the way uh, the, the Ethiopian mythologies and biblical mythology put it. And they gave back to a son who started what we call the Solomon dynasty. The Solomonic dynasty, two dynasties were the longest in African history. The Solomonic dynasty in Ethiopia, that's his name after Solomon. And the Sefawa dynasty, they, these were almost 2000 year old dynasties. And, and that Judaism is so much reflected in Ethiopian history and in the linkage with being Semitic. Uh, and you find that Semitic orientation in Ethiopia. Um, we tend to homogenize Africa in terms of the Arabic characterization of it as a, as a land of black people, blood as Sudan. And in, and in that characterization, we tend to erase clusters of other people. And sometimes we confuse Arabs with Babas. When I was in school, the people, they, they taught me to be Arab travelers. They were not Arabs, they were Babas. <laughs> and we tend not to link some of these clusters to the depth and breadth of history in terms of how these clusters, like the Hmong, like um, Jewish, like Judaism had been in Africa. And in seventh century, when the great prophet Muhammad, the peace of Allah be upon him, established Islam, we tend not to connect that to clusters of different religious centers that will not fit into the category of how the Arabs characterize Africa. Remember that in the very early foundation of that religion, remember the movement of Muslims and some non-Muslim further down south. During the, prof the time of the prophet himself. So, so if you go to Ethiopia, you're going to find many Muslims. The, the prophet moved them down to that part of the world. And, and if you look at the text very carefully, I don't know how many of you have read the Quran, which I've done. I went to Madrasa. I'm not a Muslim, but I went to Quranic school. You see how the Quran it is a combination of various traditions. You find Judaism in the Quran, no doubt about that. You find the New Testament in the Quran. It's an Abrahamic religion. And you find his own innovations. In the, today, if we had done the Quran in the modern academy, we will call it a book of plagiarism. <laughs> because the, the essential stories in the Old Testament are there. It's, it's a very brilliant book because it's, it's very short. It's, 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 it's a brilliant abbreviation of centuries of history. Uh, but, but in doing that, you must notice that the pressure that gave rise to that Quran is part of the center of a world in which Africa was part of. Just as Africa had been part of the Greco-Roman world. And you, you know that controversy that that has given rise to from the time of Cheikh and Tadiop to Mulefi Ashanti, in which they connect that, 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 that big center of the world into one narrative, which became more complicated by the Ottoman Empire, one of the greatest empires in world history, stretching to Europe until it collapsed. And if, and if you look at that Ottoman Empire very carefully, it's not just about reaching Hungary, its knowledge also spread to Africa. Also imbibing knowledge that spread from the Ottoman Empire to Africa itself. So, but in framing Islam, framing Christianity, the conventional idea is to say it's foreign. And Africans apologize for that. And my own thesis is that they don't have to apologize for that. 
they have to claim it. And in claiming it, they should pose the question, where was Jesus Christ before he was 30 years old? Where could he have been? Part of his geography will include Africa. There's just no other way about it. Where, why, how did Mark go to Africa to write the gospel? He wrote the gospel in Africa. That's where he wrote it. And, 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 that, and those currents, we don't tend to talk about it. And what about the breadth? The breadth, as the handbook captures, is expansive and elaborate such that there's actually no area that that Christianity has not penetrated. There are worthy research topics that a new generation must do in terms of this breadth and depth. And I will use Islam as an example. In, in the literature on Islam, we study the current of those who come from North Africa to West Africa. We, we, we study that effectively. And we study how knowledge circulated. So our knowledge from Islam is richer than our knowledge from Christianity in terms of that traffic. But when we also approach this topic from Islam, we see how the most valuable document was the Quran. Nobody has attempted a book on the Bible and Africa as a knowledge system. And because they have not done that, we've not accumulated enough knowledge to study the traffic of biblical ideas. But, and I'm glad the archaeologist Usman is here when you are ready to do that investigation, you will see how big is this impact. And I will use one example. The beginning of African stories, their origin, were fundamentalist traditions. Where do you come from? As in the case that Professor Osman studies, I'm Yoruba. They said they come from Evon with a chain. And these fundamentalist traditions are very common. Then they became introduced to the Bible. And this fundamentalist story began to change, sometimes collapse. They became introduced to the Quran and the fundamentalist stories began to change. So that when they say, where do you come from? They say they come from Mecca and Saudi Arabia. That's where they claim they come from. Why? Anytime you change the theory of explanation, the data becomes plastic and you can reorganize the data in line with a new theory. And as they began to track their origins outside of their own spaces, they began to add more complexity. If you go say the Igbo, where do you come from? They said they are Jewish people. That's a newer tradition. There's no way they would have formulated the Jewish origin of Igbo people without encountering the Bible. It's, it's just not possible. And those are lines of conversation and new knowledge that we have to begin to talk about. When do you begin to call yourself of Jewish origin? I mean, it's, it's, you, if you sleep, you can't dream about it. <laughs> it cannot occur to you in your dream because a new set of theories became introduced to you and you begin to run you begin to run with it. But there's also the traffic we have refused to understand and study. And we draw this from Islam. People from Africa also went to the Middle East. We've never studied that. We don't study that. West African Imams went as far as Cairo to preach. We know how people from North Africa came to West Africa, but we do not study how people from West Africa went to Morocco. Cairo was the center of the world. That was the center of the world. There was no way they would not have gone to Cairo. 
13th century, that was a dream of Mansa Musa. Let me go to Cairo. So it couldn't have been the mission of a king by himself. Other people will have joined in that. Um, but these documents have not been studied. Two examples, there are four in Sudan. Many of you were alive when that crisis erupted. There was an ethnic dimension to Darfur, which people do not know. Darfurians were not originally from Sudan. Many of them were from West Africa. You studied the trans-Saharan trans trade, which routes and maps that people track from the Western Sudan to North Africa. Central route, but people do not study the Eastern route. In fact, it's very rare for you to read books that connect that Eastern route to the trans saharan trade. What happened is from the area that you now call Nigeria and Niger, you have two options. Remember they are using pack animals and their legs. You can go in a straight line as if you are going to what we now call Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria. And when you get there, you branch right to Cairo and Saudi Arabia. But in the Eastern route, the area we now call Chad, you can make a right. You can, you, can, you can, instead of going like this, you can go like this, and it will take you to what is called Sudan. Now you run out of money. What do you do? You search in Sudan, that fall. So a community emerged. And when you are coming back, you run out of money. So many people left their homes in West Africa and settled in the fall, which became a different ethnicity. So, and, and, and this complexity led to the, you know, the country broke into two, North Sudan, South Sudan. And in that North Sudan, remember, that they do not call themselves Africans, they call themselves Afro-Arabs. You understand? In which, in that huge complex country, Afro-Arabs, Christians, ditching back to early Christianity. You understand? And, and, and the war is still there, they're still fighting, and which all these various identities Converge. I'm giving topics for Andrew Barnes PhD students. Hopefully, they will pursue them and we'll talk more. This topic has been of interest to me for 40 years. I've done books on the history of Christianity. I wrote a, a very popular book on religious violence. I've written on Christianity and values. I've written on Pentecostalism. I showed the book to my students yesterday. And I've, in, the, in the handbook, I wrote on the major figures who moved the discipline. Obukalu of blessed memory, Professor Adi Ajayi of blessed memory, and John Peel of also blessed memory. John Peel was my teacher, by the way. He taught me sociology. So I want to make 10 contributions today as if the preface is not a contribution by itself. <laughs> so point number one, Christianity has been central to identity. So in the textbook, the definition of African identity is tied to ethnicity. That is what is common. And the textbook, in understanding pluralism, it is done via the agency of ethnicity. Good, correct. So when you do it that way, you find three formations in Africa. You find the Somalia one, clan-based, in which the clan can cross-court religion. 
So the clan becomes a hegemonic way of thinking. And the theory was that they will never fight, but it turns out that they will fight. If you have studied Arabian history, if you have studied the Babas, we have studied, and my great friend is here. If you've studied more people, families fight, clans fight bitterly. That you are related by blood doesn't mean you cannot exchange swords. They fight. And then we move to the complexity of a dual society. And there's a lady there who wants to study technology and genocide in Rwanda. Rwanda is a dual society. There is no theorist in the world who has come up with any idea of how you manage a dual society. What kind of theory can you come up with? It's so difficult. If I were Tutsi, do you want me to not to go and vote for Utu? If you are Utu, do you want to vote for me? Dual societies remain permanently divided. And on that, you find how religions also comes into that definition, in addition to issues around ethnicity and the imagination of nationalities created by the Belgians. Are you light-skinned? Are you black-skinned? How does your nose look like? You understand? Remember, there was a colonial origin. But if you study the trans Saharan trade, they were also using physical bodies in terms of linking you to identities. Now you have what we do the best plural societies. As in Nigeria, 400 groups, 200 groups cobbled together. They're going to fight. They're going to fight. There is no, in fact, it's if they don't fight that you should be surprised. But in those plural societies, in their formation by colonial regimes, they were using ethnicities. Like my good friend, political scientist, Izigbo, I'm Yoruba. That's how they were framing that differences and doing their divide and rule. Subsequent years, the area we now call Central Nigeria, they now move beyond that ethnicity to convert religion into an identity. That conversion process has not been studied. Because, you know, it, it's, it's, the, the, the ethnicities are many. They're smaller groups. But Pentecostalism has now united them into a block. That tendency had been in Islam before, in which you can take Islam and convert it to an identity. So if you say Kadiria, as Utman Danfodio and his jihad, it's Kadiria, that's a form of identity. Or Tijaniya, that's a form of identity. And my favorite of all time, Ahmad Bamba, if, if you ask me at 2 a.m., who do you like the most? I would say it's Ahmad Bamba. Because what it did is to say, we can create an Islam outside of the Arab world. You don't have to be Arabs. And it, it turned into Wolof as a language. This was a guy in his 30s, like Jesus Christ. And he formulated far-reaching ideas, if it had spread across Africa, will have had Sophie, who will have a tremendous positive role on nation building. So don't, don't go via uh, the Tijani attacked him, the Kaduya attacked him, the French attacked him. And, and Tuba is a third pilgrimage center in the world. Every September, two million people will go there. So you have Mecca, you have Ali's tomb in Iraq, and you have Tuba in Senegal. Those are the three biggest pilgrimage centers in the world. And this young guy, uh, Yusin Ajami, I mean, one of, he, wrote, he wrote far more than Nafudio, but people do not know that. And they have not given him 
that credit. When you convert Christianity into identity, as in the elevation of Pentecostalism into an identity, it, it gives you alternative power of an analysis to move beyond the category of ethnicity and begin to use it to understand relationship uh, that you find central Nigeria against Fulani people, central Nigeria against Hausa people. The second point I want to make is the connection of Christianity to development. It's powerfully connected to development, irrespective of how you move the argument. Whether you talk about formal development is connected with it. Whether you move in the informal sector of development is connected with it. In both, remember that it also connects its platform to secularization in terms of secular ideas of institutions. It's not opposed to it. It connects itself with the modern state and its definition. It's not opposed to it. And if you break down the index of development, African Christianity is connected to it. It's connected to hospitals. It's connected to recruitment for jobs. It builds universities. Whether the ranking is correct or not, Covenant University is rated as the best university in Nigeria. It belongs to a church. People want to send their, their children to these faith-based schools for some reasons that were explained. So it's not anti-development. And because it's not anti-development, it has opened a set of arguments in comparison with Islam of the Boko Haram tradition. Because the argument in the Boko Haram tradition is that it is anti-Western, anti-education. Boko Haram means avoid Western education. That's what it means. That Western education is Haram. And if you, if you look at the jihadists in the Sahel, burning documents and things like that. That is the, 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 the association of Christianity with development uh, do not move in that direction. And, and if, you, if you approach this from the Christian data, they frame Muslims as not progressive. That's how they frame Islam, that they're not progressive. You may not like the, the way they frame it because religions are progressive, but in saying that they're not progressive, they mean it in terms of Western secular institutions and how you appropriate them. My third point is about intersectionality with values and morality. Can you have that Christianity without that intersectionality? It's problematic. It's profoundly problematic. And if you find conversations across Atlantic, you are going to find African Christians who think you are not Christians. They believe so, that you are church goers, but you are not Christian. They make that distinction. You are going to church as a social behavior, not because you are devout and not because you are full of faith. And in making that connection with values, it opens up clashes in various dimensions. Why should President Bush come and distribute condoms to us? He did that as part of compassionate conservatism. He did that. You may not remember I did that. I was in Cairo one time and I saw 
all these condoms on the streets. And I said, Papa, don't they have another occupation here in Cairo? And then I asked, and they said, they were using it as balloon. <laughs> and they figured out how to pump here into it. <laughs> and I was in Uganda when they said, they just said, take all this donation from the US and go and throw them away. You understand? But you can say that's a small point. The bigger issues have to do with LGBTQ. That is the bigger issue. Because in this connection between Christianity, morality, and values, Africa is homophobic. There's nothing to hide about that. You can't, I, I give the, last year or so, I give the preeminent set lectures, University of Cambridge, is their biggest annual lecture they do. And I said, I want to talk about marginal identities. And I put LGBTQ there. It was, it made so many people very angry. Very many people were angry. Church leaders called me, they called me Sultan Sokoto that what are you, is something wrong with you? You want to use your voice to talk about this? And over 6,000 people registered by WhatsApp, but they blocked it because the university said, was saying, we don't know what these people are going to do. Maybe they'll be angry. And you see how they say, look, let's break the church. Let's break the Baptist church. Let's break the Anglican church over this valuation. And let's pressure countries to enact anti-LGBTQ plus regulations, which a country like Nigeria did. So they pushed them to the closet. And religious organizations are part of this drive. It's a no-go area. It's a no-go area. And the way I explain it is that cultures have the aristocratic dimension to it. Cultures have the orthodoxy dimension to it. You cannot ask some cultures not to keep to that orthodoxy. It's not going to work because that's how they generate the stability in them. If you ask the church, why are Africans marriages now end in divorce? Like American marriages, they will say, we told you so. We told you so. They were abandon, abandoning the values and they were abandoning orthodoxy. That's what they are going to get. And then number four, it has intersectionality with power. This power dimension is bigger than what people can imagine. It's much bigger. Are you seeking power? You cannot ignore this constituency. You cannot. You cannot. The religious leaders are, and I will talk about them, them later. They are integral to your search for power. You can't just say Christianity is not part of the process. How do you get to power? It's part of the process. You can't say Islam is not important. How do you get to power? How? Well, if you approach it either from reading Foucault or reading Gramsci or reading Mas Weber, the conclusion will be the same, that it is very integral to power. But not only is it integral to power, you have to see it as power itself. Let's take two examples. The preeminent figure, they call them GEO, General Overseer of the Redeemed Church of Christ. There's no American city where there's no branch of the Redeemed Church of Christ. None. They will be in Phoenix. They'll be in Mesa. 
you know, say, say five of them. He has the power of a head of state. Heads of state will visit him. He doesn't go to them, they go to him. And they will kneel down and they will touch their heads and pray for them. Oyedepo is second example. Winner's Chapel is so powerful, extremely powerful. The Nigerian federal government just said, okay, go and have your own hair strip, your own small hair party for your private jets. There was a time he had five of them. They're enormously wealthy, enormously wealthy. Adibo is one of the of the Redeemer Church, one of the largest landowners in the state of Texas. I'm talking about people whose success are bigger than this university. Even if you sell all your buildings, they're even richer than you. I'm not making it up. And, and, and in, in that power lies the connection to my point five intersectionality with globalization. So Christianity has always been global. It's a missionary religion. But in that being global, they, they have tentacles in all major cities. Tentacles. They are bigger than what you call embassies and consulates. Just for you to understand what is going on. Imagine you set up a church in Lagos with tentacles in Sweden, Finland, Ukraine, the biggest church in Ukraine until the crisis belong to Nigeria. Imagine what you do with those tentacles in terms of visibility in terms of your ability to connect church to money, because they collect a percentage of your donations in dollar. That, that's a state. That's how we conceptualize a state. That I can be in Lagos and I say, all your donations on Sunday, one third belongs to me. What, what is the capacity of a state? A state has extractive capacity. That's what, that's what it does. The extractive capacity of the state to take from you, that's what they also do. And you cannot minimize or trivialize it because we're not talking about $100,000. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about millions and millions and millions of dollars. How much is 65 million to buy a jet? Just one check. So, so you, 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 you have to treat them that in the ability to ins insert themselves into globalization, you must see them as states within a state. And if you move via Weber, years ago, he understood what is called informal units of power. He understood it very clearly. And these churches represent the best example you can give. And yesterday, I used just one example. How can you tell 5 million people, I want you to fast for one month and they fast? Biden doesn't have that power. Biden cannot say, I want Americans to go and fast. Who is going to listen to him? Who will listen to him? But this man will say, I want you to fast. I don't want you to eat in January. Yes, sir. They won't eat. And Weber got that very clearly, that you can have units of power that are not formal. And this power has been there historically. Islamic Brotherhood, for instance. He doesn't, he doesn't respect national boundaries. So we have to create alternative maps of power for them. These are alternative maps that we have not constructed. 
I wish somebody can sit in Lusaka and his power extends to Phoenix. Imagine that and how you are able to construct that. And they've been able to use point number six, connection to leadership. Historically, for people who are smart, one of the best ways to manifest leadership has been via religion. Jesus Christ and Herod, Muhammad and Arabian authorities. When they asked Jesus Christ, who is Herod? He said, that fox. That is his language, not mine. I remember towards the end, when they took him to the judge, it's deliberate. Pilate was in the province of the Herod. That was his province. Pilate said, can you bring me a bowl? Let me just wash my hands. How can I be in the province of Herod? Are you bringing Jesus Christ for me? But what they did is to say, okay, I will create this alternative form of leadership, which they all did, which the prophets did. And this has continued in which you are able, and if you go to African-American politics, you find how the church has allowed them to manifest leadership in which the, the pulpit allows them to deliver manifestos. It's, you have to see it as leadership in connection to power. And they, they get involved in formal politics. Point number seven, because I'm not watching my time. I don't know. I have time. 10 more minutes? Oh, very good. So, they are decolonial. The, the, the frontier is to talk about decoloniality. That's what we talk about, decolonization. A student here told me that his professor asked him to read my book on decolonization, 700 pages. But in talking about this decolonia, we forgot the church. We forgot Christianity. We, we, we do not know that these are decolonial projects. We, we, we don't treat them as decolonial projects. From the 1880s, they broke away from white missionary churches. Then they created Afri African independent churches. They created charismatic movements. They created Pentecostal movements. These are decolonial projects in which they say, okay, we are going to take leadership away from white people, very successful. We will reinsert into Christianity culture, very successful. The African drums you ask us not to use, we will use them, including Bata, the drum of Shango, the god of thunder, the two side face, they use it. They, the, 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 the nicknames, the salutations, the poetry to God, they take them from traditions and they do so effectively. And in that decolonial project, they have converted Christianity into an indigenous religion, very successfully. It's so successful, the interpretation of the Bible, the worship, the songs are extremely indigenous. So you can talk about Igbo Christianity, for instance. You can talk about Yoruba Christianity, for instance. This has, these are landmark decolonial projects. And we need to also begin to write about that. They are hegemonic in terms of representation. And there are three ways to see them as hegemonic. They impose themselves on the landscape. Historically, cathedrals have imposed themselves on the landscape. If you study European history, they're the best architect at the factor. That's why you go on tourism to go and visit them. 
So you can say, I want to understand African city landscape without the church. They're there. They're huge, they're imposing, they're everywhere. But they've done an innovation that we not see in Western societies. And I will start with my city, Ibadan. I did a long walk intersecting one of the longest streets and I counted 43 churches. How, did, how can you have 43 churches in a long street? 43. You are not going to find the equivalent in London or Tempe or Mesa. You are not going to. And the reason is how they were able to take a long-standing concept of how Africans have built cities. To many of you who have not been to Africa, when you go to African city, what you see is chaos. That's how it appears to you, unfortunately. And the reason why it appears to you is how in building your cities, you distinguish between the former sector and the informal sector. And then you create what you call the suburb. That's a way of living, but not the only way of living. So if you go to the capital of Uganda, if you go to Lagos, the, it's about a blended city. It's blended. So you leave your office. Your wife says, please bring commodities for dinner, no problem. That's not a difficult task. As you move in the traffic, the traffic slows down, comes to a halt. Somebody is selling beef on a tray. Come, you buy beef, put it in your car. You move another quarter of a mile, the traffic alters. Fish seller, you buy your fish. You move a little bit more. You're in traffic, you wind up, you buy your onion, you buy your tomatoes, you buy your water, you buy your palm oil on the street. <laughs> By the time you get home, hey, Kaleji, go and bring all this stuff in the car. The food is ready. It's the management of a city. In the morning, very early, somebody's having breakfast. Don't you want breakfast? with a song and the church has followed that model, which was saying, we are not going to allocate as they do in Austin, this space for church. That's how they build churches in Austin. It's already pre-allocated. In my city, the house next to you can be a church. You understand? The house in front of you can be a church. The house at the back of your house can be a church. If you complain that you, you can't sleep, which you can't sleep anymore anyway, because they will do vigil, then you are satanic. How can the words of God annoy you? How can you be offended by preaching salvation? You must be a demon. And because they will demonize you, you just keep your mouth shut. Because you can't go to an office and complain that they put a church next to my house. Who is going to listen to you? The person you are complaining to is a member of a church. <laughs> the governor also needs the church for his own political survival. <laughs> so, and, and that imposition on the landscape is extremely, extremely powerful. And the control of domestic spaces. People have not studied how religion controls domestic spaces. So, I'm heading to Lagos on Friday. I have relations there, but I won't sleep in their house. They have nice houses. And people will say, how come you don't sleep in their houses? First of all, after they pre prepare the meals, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you must pray before you eat. 
These are long prayers. If it is just God bless this food for Christ's sake. Yes, I can manage that. <laughs> Second, you can't drink beer. Huh? You must follow rules. When you wake up, you must pray. That, that is the domestication of how religion domesticates your space so powerfully. And you must have a religion. If you're in Nigeria, you can't say you don't have a religion in your neighborhood. You can't say that. You must either be a Muslim or a Christian. If you say you are nothing, if somebody dies, you are the one who kills the person. You are a ritualist. So you have to say, ah, I'm a Christian, even when you are not. Oh, I'm a Muslim. You must claim something. And in saying that, you, in asking you to claim something, you say domestication. It's competitive. Religions are competitive. Whether it's Islam or Christianity is very competitive. So what is the future of Christianity? The, the future of Christianity is extremely brilliant. Modernization theories have collapsed in saying that it's going to recede. That was a diet when I was in school, it collapsed completely. The argument is to say that as society develops, it is going to, it is going to leave behind religious forces. What Africa has done is to say, we can develop, we can have a future, but we don't have to leave religion behind. And for those of you who like to do policy work, you have to begin to revisit your theoretical parameters. Marxism collapsed because the assumption is that social classes, all of them, we dissolve all this religion. No. No. There's no American, there's no African presidential house where you're not going to find a church and a mosque. They pray. Our colleagues in universities pray, not just in faith-based schools. I went to examine a PhD the University of Joss. It's a public school. We started with a prayer. And I was laughing to myself when there was a line before me, may this candidate pass his PhD exam. <laughs> After he prayed like that, who is the standard examiner that will fail the student? <laughs> and then the power of Jesus Christ. <laughs> so, so we have to say, let us, let us just begin to think in terms of new theoretical parameters. That we stop saying that these churches and mosques will just disappear and begin to work with them. They're going to be part of rapid growth and youthful population. The idea that the youth will disconnect themselves from religion as you have in the US and Europe, I think we have to begin to revisit it. It is not working that way. And we have to be very respectful to our data. We have to respect the data instead of ignoring that data. Islamic fundamentalism, Islamic religion, they've expanded, not necessarily through the older generation or through young people. And the same thing is with Christianity, in which younger people are so much integrated into the church. Uh, and you see some of the songs that I started this class with. Pentecostalism will continue to grow. African theologians have emerged. We have not studied them enough, in which they are doing their interpretations in very creative ways. 
you know Desmond Tutu, you know Yedipo. These are formidable theologians. And we, begin, we should begin to write PhD thesis on their theologies. The, 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 the documents are very impressive. They are major writers, but we have not integrated these theologies. They will continue to talk about development and social justice. They will talk about how morality can be part of the secular system. They, they are connected to the digital world far more than what you and I can imagine. They are very tech savvy. They make their own movies, their own songs. They have branches that take technology seriously. They dominate the air space, television space. And they are going to keep offering challenges to globalization in terms of how they want Christianity to be inserted into it. Let me conclude. This topic was imposed on me by Andrew Banks, asking me to talk about Christianity in his own historic imagination from the Stone Age <laughs> to the present. I hope I've kept fidelity to that instruction, but I've also done my own insurgency in terms of highlighting the topics of my own interest. That Christianity has changed, it will continue to change, it's been flourishing. Current figures put the Christian population at 600 million. And at that number, it is the most expansive frontier of Christianity. And the projection is that it's going to reach over a billion in the next 30 years or so, by which time you are going to have more African Catholics, more African Protestants than Europe and Latin America. What this number will do is unknown, but this number will be part of the energy of Christianity. It will connect to a global movement that will demand for the insertion of African theologies into global Christianity. And it will demand forcefully for an African Pope. Thank you. Okay, we've got time for questions. Uh, who would like to go first here? We have some Christians. Yeah. So you are Catholic, right? Why are you where, where is your Catholic? Where is your Catholic question? Oh, your building is here? Yes, six o'clock. Wow. <clears throat> thou, sh thou shalt not fall. <laughs> and don't lend your temptation if anybody asks you to fall from the sixth floor. Because, because you are a son of God. Tell the person, thou shalt not tempt God, your Lord. <laughs> And the challenges. And the challenges. And you work extensively on and uh, Which has become a major a serious problem. 
and in fact, anti-development in many respects. Okay, and I, it's corrupt. It has the it it is eaten deep into the fabric. It's become part of the uh, clientelist. Uh, New, they, they become the new big man, the new African big man, and part of uh, a major contributing factor to autocratization. People call it democratic uh, backsliding. I don't like that one because it's a, it's, the assumption is that these African countries were already democratic and then they're backsliding. They haven't gotten there yet. So I, I prefer the, the word autocratization. And really, Christian religious uh, actors are a critical uh, driving force towards this autocratization we find in many uh, countries. Secondly, uh, part of the legacy of European colonialism or evangelization in Africa is the transportation of European tribalism into Africa. You know, I mean, in many, even the Catholic faith, for example, a French priest will tell you not to go to confession uh, to, uh, to uh, an English priest, okay? Let alone German, okay? <laughs> and then the problem of ecumenism was even made worse with the emergence of Pentecostal. So on a given Sunday, Africans are more divided even beyond their ethnic identities by their religious, re religious affiliations. And this is something imported from <clears throat> Europe. Uh, it has continued while the Pope talks about, he's, he's been very good in pushing uh, ecumenism back to the center of uh, Catholic politics. Mm -hmm. uh, it hasn't worked. Christians are more divided. Thank you. Unless you're talking about LGBT. No, that's all right. And, and all that well, the, the, so, thank you. So the, my, my yeah, question yeah. is, uh, are these not part of the Yes, thank you. Thank you. So I appreciate the question. And I will, because people tend to forget. So let me walk from your last question back to the front. Sunday is the most segregated day in America. Hmm? Break up to those, they go to their church. Catholic go to their church. I don't know about Tempe or Phoenix. In Austin, Hispanic Catholic church. My wife is Catholic. She goes to a black Catholic church. It's white Catholic church, right? And the same thing with the Church of England, Irish. This is so, uh, that's not an African phenomenon. I mean, it's the same thing here. In, in, in this your city, but, and at least it's, 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 it's a bigger project of how sectarianism emerged in Christianity. Islam will say that it's not sectarian. It's a Muslim sitting by you, but they also have divisions, Shiite, Sunni, Sufi, non Sufi. And th this, these are bigger projects. Students will ask me, why is Iran fighting Saudi Arabia? I say, hey, it started from the Caliph Ali. It's a, it's, a, it's a fight that began in the seventh century, which has not been settled. So, all those, um, I doubt we, you and I can solve that ecumenical division. Indeed, my projection is that whether it's in Mexico or US or Nigeria, these bigger churches were atomized when the funders died. Because other people have seen this ambition and they're going to create their own churches. And you find a phenomenon in Liberia, Ghana, Nigeria, we have these church leaders are behaving like the American counterparts, transferring these churches to their children, to their son. Graham, which is okay. The church belongs to me. 
I'm retiring, I'm, I'm going to die. Let me will it to my son. We have not seen their will in the case of Nigerian church leaders. Nobody is privy to the will. Maybe they are going to transfer these multi-billion projects to their children. So the, in addition to your European tribalism, which I like, is also patriarchy. You know, they also do, these are patriarchal organizations. Some of them are misogynists. Uh, they won't sit like that. Uh, and these divisions are there. Now, the most fascinating to me, two of them, the big man theory. And the outcome is, you have to bring me back. How the tradi traditional template of organizing polities via chiefs and kings. When you say Alafi, the Buganda, the king. These Pentecostal leaders are now more powerful than those kings. Just to support your, your theory. The kings now bow to them. You're supposed to bow to the king. But the kings are now the ones bow to them and call them Pentecostal their own leaders. So you, you see how the, the traditional power structures that the British, the French inherited have become reconfigured via the church in which this church leader, now about corruption, I don't want to offend any Christian here. The church has always been, churches have always been corrupt, historically, from their foundation. You remember the name of the treasurer, of the disciple of 12? Judas, who stole the church money? <laughs> we have, churches have always been like that. It's not an African phenomenon. Um, they have always been like that. Thank you for your expansion. Uh, other questions here? Please. Thank you. Um, yeah, you know, just this is, I'm not as familiar with, with what you've been saying. I've just been very interested in so much. And I, I know Christianity is, is your subject area. You mentioned earlier that this idea of the informal units of power. And I would just be curious if you, I'm curious, like you're talking about how the churches are, are you know, have some more power than states in some capacity. Would you say that in your view, that would also apply in it, to Islam, or would that be unique mm -hmm, to the Christian mm -hmm, churches mm -hmm. in Africa? Yeah, but the, the only difference, it, it applies to Islam. The only difference, remember, remember in his origin, seventh century, the document and the practice and the adit. Remember, is differently constituted because the prophet Muhammad knew about Christianity. So, Jesus Christ was in the synagogue, right? And they asked him, Messiah, should I pay tax? You know what he said? He said, he said give unto Caesar what is Caesar, and give unto Lord what belongs to the Lord. He said, I can't save you from the emperor. You don't pay your tax. The emperor will throw you into jail. I'm not your savior. So, if you've read the Quran, it's framed against the background of a very corrupt society. And if you, if you understand very clearly, the prophets, Underpinning lies, I'm the last prophet. 
after me, there will be no other prophet. Amadi got into trouble, creating the Amadiya movement because he called himself a prophet. You can't call yourself a prophet in Islam. You are no longer a prophet. The last prophet died in the seventh century. For that to work, he departed from that given to Caesar what is, he departed from that distinction. He departed from it, in which was saying, let's separate this, this state from this Christianity. Muhammad said, no, no, you are not going to separate both. Let, let us match the power. And in Umar, where he presided, it was a combination of that. The second caliph was one who put the Quran together. Third caliph, they killed him. Fourth caliph, not only did they kill him, he was chopped into pieces. And some people have said that is the origin of what is called soccer, because they took his arm to be kicking his head. I'm not making all this thing up, that's the way they, and they said, that's how you are now kicking football. That he started by kicking human beings. And in that fundamental, you cannot say you are making that distinction. Islam does not even allow you to do that. Uh, and you see its manifestations in various formations in which even secular leaders claim, not as caliph, but they claim the dominance of that religion. I, years ago, I read it from Kadun, right? Uh, where he would have been the best to answer your question, uh, but we can't go back to the Ottoman Empire. And, and he was saying, look, Falola, you are a scholar. Be careful of the Imam or be careful of the political leader because in combining both or separating them, there are consequences. And your question goes into the anti-secularist movement in the Sahel. In the Boko Haram, the ISIS, the jihadists are saying, we do not want the secular states with that division in which you are saying, this is what is secular, this is what is religious. Why can't you have a religious state in which you, you underwrite into institutions and you embed into structures Islamic principles. So it's even far more, far more rigid than the Christianity which, through which you pose your question. It's far more expansive than that. Thank you. Uh, one final question? There's, I think it's you. So, somebody wants, two of you wanted to ask questions. Please. Uh, so my question is, how do you see the cross currents between Christianity and African nationalism within any of the African countries? Yes. So you want me to be a standard examiner? I'm making a joke. <laughs> you said you're a PhD student. I thought you were asking me to be a standard. You want me to be a standard examiner? You didn't, you didn't catch the joke. Okay. Uh, how do I see? What's your question again? So it's been there from the very beginning. Whether you do African American history, or you do wherever you find Christianity, you are going to find that nationalism. It's 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 been connected. Uh, they were modernists. 
19th century, Christianity and modernity have been connected. Christianity, Islam, and nationalism have been connected. If you look at the European conquest of Africa, Islam organized resistance. If you look at, you can't study African independence movement without the interjection of Christianity and nationalism. They contributed enormously to the nationalist project. You can't, you can't study slavery and resistance and not connect it. You can't study the translation of the Bible. And by translation, I don't mean as languages. I mean as their localization, enculturation. These are nationalist projects. So, Please, you are going to help me. I want to close this lecture with amazing grace. Please help me to look for it and play it. So that's how I want to close my lecture, amazing grace. So all those Christian leaders, they were also manifesting nationalist projects, whether through decoloniality, through demand for modernity, and through politics. The, so the way, okay, the way they were reading the mission of Christ, even from the plantation, is to say, we've suffered and we have been crucified. You understand? That's how they were reading the ministry of Jesus Christ. Oh, if you listen to Bob Marley, Redemption Song, that's how they are reading it. And that on the third day, they will resurrect and reclaim the glory of God. You find that in African-American traditions, you find that in African traditions in which Western education and the Bible produce their own contradictions. You know, if, if, if you take any biblical tests, anyone, you know, 10 of us will read it differently. When the psalm was introduced to me in elementary school, we were using the psalm to escape from being punished by the school teacher. Who I will run away to go and play soccer. I know that I've committed some problems, that the parents will beat me. The Lord is my shepherd became a salvation document <laughs> for my parents to forgive me. You understand? And that is precisely how we read religious texts. Because there's nothing you are looking for in a religious document that you're not going to find. It's, 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 it's adaptable, it's ageless, it's timeless. And you can take any document, right? and convert it to your own aspiration. May God let you pass your exam. Say amen. May the mountain that this department has erected in front of you, may God level it down. <laughs> Let's play. Please play Amazing Grace for me. <laughs>